This is AOS Shorts. Get better fast. Hey guys, and welcome to the first AOS Shorts episode for 2018. With such a great release as Mac King of Nurgle, I just couldn't resist putting out a show. Twitter's currently awash with green, frothy enthusiasm, and the book has been covered in detail by the great Facehammer podcast, Chris Tomlin's uh, review on TGA, and Tyler Mengel's blog post. So I highly recommend you check them out. However, as always, I think there's room for the iOS shorts treatment. So in the next 20 minutes or so, I hope to cover the key points you need to know, whether you intend to play Nurgle or will be facing them on the tabletop. So in terms of first impressions, overall, the battle tome looks internally balanced with a range of choices for Nurgle generals. There seem to be few automatic selections. And from all the chat that has been flying around, there are a lot of army list ideas out there. Certainly the WhatsApp group is exploding at the moment. This has to be the just reward of the more expensive and more extensive feedback and playtesting that the book went through. I think the face, gam- face Hammer guys said that it went through a couple of rounds of testing with them. In terms of playstyle, the Maggotkin are still super resilient, whether through debuffs to hit, more widespread methods for ignoring wounds and mortal wounds, or through regeneration and healing. If you don't apply enough firepower to your target, then you're going to quickly find those large models will be back up to full strength. Characteristically, no armors have been slow and shambling, but the new book allows you a number of ways to counteract that, through the new feculent null moors, the Nurgle tree terrain pieces, the bell on the great unclean one, and the cycle of contagion, the allegiance ability I'll get to. So you definitely don't want to understand, underestimate the speed with which you could have Nurgle units in your face early game. Finally, the book is awash with mortal wound output, not in a Disciples of Zinch way, but in a steadily chipping off a small number of wounds from multiple units kind of way. There are two, inf- in, in two infinite range spells that do D3 mortal wounds to multiple targets, and one infinite range ability that does D3 mortal wounds to multiple units. Nurgle armies are going to grind you down and knock out your support heroes if you don't neuter them. Now, all of these characteristics can be tailored through intelligent use of command traits, artifacts, and spells. However, in the new General's Handbook 2017 world of higher-cost battalions, you're going to have to make choices. You can't have everything, and with the prevalence of special characters in Maggotkin of Nurgle lists who can't take generic traits, your available slots are even more limited. So in short, the new Nurgle book is going to reward top quality list writing and game management. This is definitely not an auto-win army, but in the hands of a skilled general it will perform well, and there's enough choice that you won't be bored with being pigeonholed into one particular build. Now, with that out of the way, let's look at the battle tome in a bit more detail. Just like Blades of Corn and the Disciples of Zinch books, the Nurgle book is split into three factions – Rotbringers, Mortals, and Demons of Nurgle. Armies with the Nurgle keyword can have the Nurgle allegiance, and within that, units within the Rotbringers, Mortal, or Nurgle Demon keywords can access the command traits, artifacts, and spells available to those keywords. Because the army rests on the Nurgle keyword, you can freely use Pestilence and Slave to Darkness units that share the Nurgle keyword, or that are given the keyword on setup. The key allegiance ability is the cycle of corruption. The Nurgle wheel that we first saw in the Blightwall box. So pick one up for handy in-game tracking if you haven't got one. The cycle of corruption contains seven effects, buffs and debuffs, that apply to the battlefield for that battle round. As the cycle applies to the battlefield, it applies equally to both armies, if you're playing against another Nurgle army, for instance. At the start of the game, you roll a dice to determine the starting point on the wheel. Each turn the wheel moves clockwise at the start of the hero phase. Should be clear that's your hero phase. Now, one of the concerns of match play gamers after seeing the Blight War box was the difficulty of optimizing list builds around a random roll. However, the battle tome contains a number of ways that you can modify the wheel in order to get the bonus you want when you need it. In particular, the Grandfather's Blessing Command Trait and the Foundry Genesis spell known by all Nurgle wizards. Through clever use of these abilities, you can have mortal wound output every single turn. Now, the second aspect of the Allegiance ability is that Nurgle armies come with free terrain, just like Sylvaneth armies. At the beginning of the game, 
after rolling for scenario, but before picking sides, a Nurgle player can set up a feculent Nullmore for free. The Nullmore is an effective wood that has an aura, which causes mortal wounds to nearby non-Nurgle units, and allows Nurgle units within 7 inch of it, inches of it to run and charge. More Nullmores can be summoned during the game by using Contagion points, which I'll get to, or brought onto the table by um, units like Horticular Slimax, the big um, excellent snail riding model from the Blightwall box, allowing some great board control. I can also see them being very useful in scenarios which require heroes to hold objectives. Put a Nullmore on the objective and watch your opponent's five or six wound heroes get chipped away by the mortal wound aura. So, Contagion Points. They're Nurgle's own mechanics similar to Korn's Blood Tithe. Nurgle armies earn Contagion Points in each of their hero phases, based on having units in your deployment zone, units in your enemy's deployment zone, and Nullmores with no enemies nearby. These points accumulate during the game and can be spent on summoning demons of Nurgle. The summoning rules for these demons have changed. You can no longer summon demons of Nurgle by casting spells. Bye bye plague bearers in um, Disciples of Zinch lists, for instance, and can only do so by spending contagion points. Because you no longer cast a spell, there's no risk of being unbound. However, you still pay reinforcement points for that unit in match play. The summoned unit is set up at the end of your movement phase, within 12 inches of a hero or Nalmore, and at least 9 inches away from enemies. Now, given how the points accumulate, I don't see mass Nurgle summoning lists being popular or effective. It just takes too long to accumulate points. Um, I've put in the show notes for this some analysis that was done by Jabba Zinch on um, Twitter as to the expected number of points in each turn based on a number of assumptions. So it seems that the best use of the points is to put them into more null mores um, in the first turn and the start of the game. Um, and then perhaps summon a small unit for capturing objectives late game, or not at all. Moving on to command traits. In terms of command traits, there are three shared command traits and three unique ones. For each of Rockbringers, Mergle, um, sorry, Mortals, and Demons of Nurgle. As others have mentioned, I suspect the most common command trait you will see is likely to be Grandfather's Blessing, which allows you to move the cycle of corruption one way or forward or back once per battle. In terms of artifacts, there are six unique artifacts for each of the factions. There's a lot of choice here, so I'll just touch on the most common ones you will likely see. For me, it's always worth using command traits and artifacts to support your army's strengths, rather than accommodate for their weaknesses. If you're accommodating for your weaknesses, you sort of just hit a middle-of-the-road kind of list um, in most cases. So, looking at these, in terms of Rockbringers, the two ones that stand out there are Rustfang and the Muttergrub. The Rustfang um, reduces an enemy unit's armor save permanently by one for the whole rest of the battle if um, that unit suffers a wound as a result of the Rustfang. The Muttergrab allows a wizard to cast an extra spell, and as we get onto the Law of Nurgle, you'll see that there's a lot of um, prospect for mortal wound output, so you really want to make sure that you're casting as many spells as possible if you're going down that route. In terms of Demons of Nurgle, there's three. There's the Endless Gift, which um, in the Battle Shock phase, the model can heal all wounds that it has taken that turn. The Wither Stave, which requires enemies within 12 inches to re-roll sixes to hit. Very, very useful against things like blood letters, um, skyfires, etc. Um, and the Tome of a Thousand Poxes, which again, if you're going to be going for a magic heavy list, you would want, because it gives plus one to cast for a wizard. Now, there's also some really powerful but unreliable choices available. So within the Rockbringer, List there's the Fecund Flask, which once per game on a 2 plus you will heal all your wounds. On a 1, you die. Um, so very high risk and reward there. But very useful if you say got only one wound left. In terms of the demons artifacts, you've got Nurgle's Nail, which is if you cause wounds with this weapon, you can roll a two, two D you can roll two D6. And on a seven, you auto-kill the model that you wounded. 
Finally, for the mortals, they have the Eye of Nurgle, which once per battle, the nearest model to the bearer dies on a 2d6 roll of a 7. Now, whilst these three things appear very powerful, the chance of rolling a 7 on 2d6 is only 16.6%, or on average less than once a game if you could use it every turn. Therefore, you'll need to consider if the threat and board control of those artifacts are worth it versus something which may not be so sexy or scary, but will have more consistent and synergistic impact for your army. Now let's look at the law of Nurgle. Now, the new law provides three spells per faction. Each Nurgle wizard knows the Foul Regenesis spell, in addition to one from their law. The Foul Regenesis spell allows you to immediately reset the cycle of contagion to the stage of your choice. Now, whether the effect goes off that turn or simply sets you up for the next turn will, dispend, will depend on the stage you choose and its wording. As a general comment, the casting costs are high for the Law of Nurgle, and the spells predominantly have a short to mid-range. Therefore, if you're building an army around the spells, you will need to buff the cast. The Great Unclean One can now cast two spells and can be plus two to cast, using an artifact and the dagger but is limited to the demon spells, which aren't as strong as the Rockbringer or mortal spells. Rockbringer wizards can use blades of pre... pre ugh, so many hard words to say in the Nurgle book. Blades of putrefaction, which casts on a seven, and is a buff which means that a unit inflicts a mortal wound as well as other damage if it rolls a six plus to hit. Notable mentions in the Rockbringer lore include Rancid Visitations and Gift of Contagion, but both are more situational. The best spell in the Nurgle Mortals lore, if not the book, is Plague Squall, which on a casting value of a 6 allows you to dish out d3 mortal wounds to d6 enemy units visible to the caster at unlimited range. That's probably the closest thing to a plus one in the book. There are notable mentions for the Glorious Afflictions and Favoured Poxes debuffs in the Demon Spell lore, especially if you're playing a contain list, but now you can't summon a wizard and then cast the spell, so they're less useful, which is why I think you'll see more of the Rockbringer and Mortal spells. Now, normally this would be the point of the show where I talk about the War Squall Battalions, but I don't really think there's much for me to add here beyond Chris Tomlin's excellent review over at TGA, so I've put a link in the show notes and I highly recommend you go check it out. But I would suggest at this stage that I think the most common battalion you'll see is the Plague Touch Warband, which is in the ever-chosen Battle Tome rather than the new Maggotkin of Nurgle book. I'll discuss why shortly in the Potential Army Build section. Now on to allies. Nurgle can ally with Korn, Brayherds, Chaos Gargans, Everchosen, Monsters of Korn, Slanish, Slaves to Darkness, excluding Zinch and Warherds. There's three things I want to note at this stage. One, that if you're going for a resilient debuff list, then Hellstriders of Slanish could be a useful addition because they've got their minus one to hit um, within six inches bubble, could be a useful another um, debuff to hit. And as we see from Byron Ord's um, recently successful order list, debuffs to hit can be very, very effective. Now, also going to note, you can still ally in a Gaunt Summoner with Familiars on Bailwind, thanks to the ever-chosen keyword. And while you cannot ally in Zinch Demons, you can of course still summon them. There's nothing restricting you on summoning in things like Pink Horrors. So if you don't care about the lore, that is. Now, in terms of summoning, a pool of about 120 points would seem to work well. You could summon a beast of Nurgle for some crucial positioning. You could have 10 plague bearers to capture an objective. You could have a Bailwind or um, a Herald of Zinch if you want to use the 18-inch Mortal Wound spell. The only final thing I'll say in relation to allies is that I'll take this and I'll update the um, Chaos Allies matrix um, that I have hosted on AOSShorts.com and a couple of resources available that... Um, allow you to easily see which factions can ally with which other factions. Now, turning on to some army list predictions, I'm going to have a go at trying to predict some likely Nurgle army builds. The Blight Kings have been getting a lot of love online, thanks to them getting cheaper and gaining an extra wound, 
but I want to offer some alternatives to Blight King's um, Great Unclean One and Plague Bearers. Um, both of these lists have been proposed by local mastermind James Page, so all credit and responsibility really lies with him. The first is what he calls a control and sustain build, which uses Rotagus's deluge spell, a great unclean one, Glockin and support casters, to put out a range of buffs and mortal wounds behind a safe wall of resilient troops. I haven't got a finished list in mind at this stage, but the fundamentals are there for a solid list that will grind you down. The second is a Plague Touch Warband Alpha Strike Chaos Knight list, which can be one drop or two. The Plague Touch Warband contains one mortal Nurgle hero and seven mortal Nurgle units, and makes its units minus one to hit in combat, and can give some units the ability to do mortal wounds back to opponents that attack them. Now, as we all know, Warhammer Weekly's Tom writes all the successful lists in, War in Age of Sigma, and I know he's been a big fan of the Plague Touch Warband although I confess I haven't seen or listened to his proposed list. So the list I've um, got largely revolves around Glockin, large units of Chaos Knights, a shrine, and other support pieces. The aim is to tie up all your opponent's resources dealing with a buffed Chaos Knight unit, which is in their face turn one. The unit can be minus one to hit, have extra attacks for both the mounts and riders, can be re-rolling to wound, can cause mortal wounds and be extra quick, thanks to the Nur Nurgle Allegiance abilities. With the movement buffs, you don't need Sal, and don't have to worry about charging from 9 inches away. So what do the lists look like? Well, the one-drop version is a Plague Touch Warband, Glockin, Chaos Sorcerer, 14 Chaos Knights, the number is important, and you're only given that you buy Chaos Knights in units of 5, by setting up with 14, you're only losing one model, but you get the benefits of the formation. Another 14 Chaos Knights, a shrine, 10 marauders, 10 marauders, and 10 marauders. That's 2,000 points. The second list is a two drop. Now, the trade off with the two drop is that you lose the Plague Touch warband buffs on the Chaos Knights, but you gain access to Rotogus's Deluge spell and some of the other mortal wound spells, which give you flexibility and reach, gives you the ability to reach to hit some of the um, opponent's support pieces in their back line. The two drop list is a play touch warband, Glockin, Rotagus, Rockbringer Sorcerer, 10 Chaos Knights, 10 Chaos Knights, Shrine, and then three lots of 10 Marauders for Battle Line. That's 19, 18 points, so you may get a triumph out of it as well. So those are some list suggestions. It'd be really interesting to see um, where things go. Now, thinking about this, well, what armies are going to perform well against Nurgle? What do you do if you're going to be facing a Nurgle army? Disciples of Zinch will, of course, still be strong. The army can um, unbind the Nurgle spells, has great chaff lines, and can out-duel Nurgle in the mortal wound fight, even with Nurgle's disgustingly resilient saves. Seraphon lists should also do well at shutting down the Nurgle magic phase. Given the grind nature of many Nurgle lists, it seems like you'd need a very efficient Alpha Strike that can take out the Nurgle characters and support pieces before the rest of the army is buffed up. Caradron Overlords can achieve this, but if you don't succeed in your first turn Alpha Strike, then you're going to lose your own heroes very quickly and could be swamped under a green tide. Finally, and don't laugh, but Pestilence will actually play well against Nurgle. The army will benefit from all the Nurgle buffs, is protected from Nurgle's mortal wound output generally, and thanks to the Nile Moors, could have a massive wave of Plague Monks in combat turn one. If you make Nurgle take enough saves, then not even the disgustingly resilient rule will save them. Incidentally, if you're interested in Pestilence, I highly recommend you check out local New Zealand player Aidan's TGA blog, The Acolytes of the Withered Word. I'll put a link in the show notes. That's really it in terms of what I wanted to cover um, for this first impression show. Thanks for listening. I'm really interested to hear what you think about the book and what we're going to see. It's going to be interesting to see how the tournament meta changes over the next few months, especially with Malign Portents and the Legions in the Gash book coming up as well. I also expect we won't have long to wait, as usual, given how quick and easy it is to paint up a Nurgle army. Normally there can be quite a lag before we see armies on the tabletop. Um, I don't think that's going to be anything like the case in relation to getting Nurgle armies out there. I expect they'll be all over the um, scene soon. 
Now, as I said at the start of the show, there's a lot of great coverage out there on the Maggot King of Nurgle book. Um, I highly recommend that you check it out. I've put a number of links in the show notes. Um, there's also a Maggot King of Nurgle WhatsApp group, if you're interested, um, which is getting a lot, a lot of chat at the moment as people are um, list building and um, sharing all their thoughts and ideas. So it's a really good time um, to be involved at the moment if you're a Chaos player. Anyway, as I said... Look forward to hearing from you guys. The easiest places to catch me are um, at, at Antipodean7 on Twitter. That's A-N-T-I-P-O-D-E-A-N-7. Um, AOS Shorts on Facebook um, at aosshorts.com where you'll find all the show notes, resources, etc. And increasingly this year I'm going to be using my um, YouTube channel for AOS Shorts where I'll also be putting up additional content. So... Anyway, bye for now. Look forward to hearing from you guys. See you.